Boa tarde a todo mundo que está acompanhando mais uma conversa com editores. Meu nome é Rafael Groma, eu sou diretor científico da Compós, Associação Nacional dos Programas de Pós-Graduação em Comunicação, e a Compós está organizando de, desde agosto até dezembro uma série de conversas com editores, sempre alguém do Brasil e alguém de fora do Brasil, para a gente conversar sobre as práticas editoriais e as questões concernentes às revistas acadêmicas. É, para a conversa de hoje, eu vou chamar a, a, a moderadora do dia, a professora Laura Guimarães Correia. É, a, Laura... Eu vou... é, a Laura é professora do, do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Comunicação Social da UFMG, da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, e é líder do Coragem, Grupo de Pesquisa em Comunicação, Raça e Gênero, desde 2018. Ela integra a direção do Centro Internacional de Semiótica e Comunicação, CISECO, e tem o um projeto aprovado no Cap Sprint para atuação com professora visitante sênior na Goldsmiths University of London, em 2022, em colaboração com a London School of Economics, onde ela também fez estágio de pós-doutorado. Ela é patrona da Associação Black British Academics, desde 2020, e é membro do Editorial Board do International Journal of Culture Studies. Seja bem-vinda, Laura. Prazer estar aqui com você. Boa tarde, Rafael. Obrigada pelo convite para estar aqui nessa conversa. Parabéns à Compós pela iniciativa. Boa tarde a todas e todos. E, uh, bom, acho que a gente pode começar. Um, welcome, Monica. Welcome, José Luiz Aydar Prado. It's a pleasure to have you with us this afternoon to talk about... Um, in this conversation with editors of scientific journals in the area of communication. Um, thank you for being with us. Um, I'm going to uh, give a brief presentation of the participants today. Um, Monica Balia Chibita is an associate professor in Dean and Dean of the Faculty of Journalism, Media and Communication at the Uganda Christian University. She's an associate editor of Journal of African Media Studies and editorial board member of South African Journal of Communication, Theory, Theory and Research, among others. José Luiz Aidar Prado is a professor in communication and semiotics at the Pontificial Con at Catholic University of Sao Paulo. He's editor of Galaxia Journal. He's editorial board member of many journals in Brazil and co-author of the article, Towards an Inclusive Agenda of Open Science for Communication Research, published, published in Journal of Communication. Well, um, we're going to start listening to Monica Chivita about her experience, about the journal she um, She works in, she participates. Thank you, Monica. And um, yeah. Thank you very much. So um, I've been introduced, Monica Chibita from Uganda. And I've been working with the Journal of African Media Studies since 2006. We, we started in 2006, but started very, very slowly. We had a publisher that wasn't very, very helpful. So after three years, we realized it wasn't going to work and we decided to move to Intellect, or who is our current publisher. And, uh, and the motivation for this journal was really the need to, first of all, understand the history of media studies in Africa, because we felt like there wasn't a lot of attention paid to that, and especially media studies from a qualitative approach. Um, the other idea, of course, was to, to to open up discussion on uh, how do we strike the balance between collaborating globally but also being locally relevant. And, uh, and we were, you know, responding to various questions, um, realities on the continent, the shrinking space for media freedom and, and so on, as well as the arts. Um, We, we publish a lot of work about the arts. We actually do a film review as often as possible, almost in every issue, as well as a book review, etc. And we were, when we started, there were three of us. There's uh, Professor Winston Mano from the University of Westminster. He's originally from Zimbabwe. 
myself as associate editor, and we had another colleague called Wendy Williams, who comes from the Netherlands, but I think she's right now in Zimbabwe. And then, of course, with time, we grew. We now have a managing editor called uh, Professor Nkosi Nlela, and, and the second associate editor called Ike Chukwobiaya from West Africa. We have a large, a fairly large editorial board. We expanded it recently. Fairly large editorial board with people from various continents. And then we have an even larger advisory board, international advisory board. We publish three times a year. And, um, and we take articles from, from all corners of the world and, and really different focus. Sometimes we have a themed issue. Sometimes it's not a themed issue. And sometimes we actually entertain special issues edited by, by other people. Um, I think that's it in brief. We, I'm happy to answer questions at question time. Okay, uh, Monica Chibeta, thank you so much for this presentation. I will uh, now we're going to listen to Luisa Ida about Galaxia and your well, whatever you'd like us to know about Galaxia and the process of publishing. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation uh, of Compose of Rafael. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Laura and with Monica. Uh, well, uh, we started in Galaxia in 2001. So we, have, we, we are in the 10, 21st year of life of the journal. Uh, and the journal appeared in another contest uh, conceived as a transdisciplinary journal of communication, semiotics and culture. Uh, we, we were dedicated to all those confluences and connections uh, between science and politics and culture. And mm -hmm. uh, we received uh, collaborations of those who had adopted any semiotic or discursive perspective uh, or in a most general view, uh, let's say a, a, a production of meaning. I think this is the, 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 the most, uh, the axis of our interest, the, the production of meaning approach as a, as a way of thinking, arts and culture always understood as communication phenomena. Mm. Uh, this presentation is still valid today as long as we think of semiotics as a theory of meaning, not in strict terms, not only in the concrete semiotics, because there are a lot of semiotics. Even though the journal has incorporated many epistemological trends and diverse sub-areas since then and expanded the theories of meaning in, in its inscription in description surface, our journal still has the perspective of approaching communication, communication phenomena and processes, uh, but with strong expectations in a, in a, a theoretical development in research. Uh, I think that a scientific journal should follow not only the perspectives of object process analysis, but also the different modes of theoretical and epistemological appropriation within the field of communication. Synthetically, today, the journal aims to first understand the transit transformation and flow
whose theoretical and epistemological basis are also in transit. The signifier galaxia, as the, 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 the first editor, Irene Machado, puts it, uh, affiliate, was affiliated to a semiotic poetic tradition that the poet and translator Haroldo de Campos created with his poem, Galaxias. Uh, Campos was on, one of the founders of our postgraduate program in Pontificia Universidade Católica in 72. Uh, well, uh, in its first phase, uh, the, the first phase of the journal, uh, the journal was printed and now uh, it's only online. And uh, it had a, a specially designed graphic project to express the relationship between communication and semiotic machinery. Uh, in terms of periodicity, until 2015, the journal was biannual. Between 16 and 20, it became quarterly, a quarterly publication. And in this year, 21, uh, we became a continuous publication. In all these years, the journal was consolidated, favoring the construction of a scientific council and ad hoc reviewers that could gradually deepen the ways of analyzing the texts and thicken the reviews uh, in order not only to accept or reject the texts, but uh, also to help researchers to improve their papers. I think this is the most important task of a journal, not only to accept or reject, but help. Mm -hmm. Uh, mainly with complete and substantiated opinions. And in this line, we strongly emphasize the importance of review and non-recommendation opinions so that they provide subsidies and indications for the reformulations of articles, even when they are denied. Uh, and which may ev eventually afterwards be resent to other journals. Uh, the members of the Scientific Council linked to several postgraduate programs in communication in Brazil and abroad uh, have academic maturity and seniority in research. At each period, we seek to renew the reviewers, adding new researchers with good production, uh, insertion in the field. And in this context, peer review is regularly carried out according to nationally and internationally recommended rules. The published tests authored by national and foreign arts researchers meet the qualification compatible with the necessary impact in the field of communication. In 2012, the journal was cataloged in the A2 classification level by the Qualis Capis Committee in the area of applied social sciences. And in the same year, it was distinguished by the Scientific Electronic Library Online, the Cielo, to integrate its collection under conditions to be met until the next year, 2013, in order to entry in the indexation uh, system. Cielo is one of the most prestigious and selective electronic libraries of scientific periodicals maintaining, uh, maintained in the country by FAPESP, the, the scientific agency of the state of Sao Paulo. Joining Cielo was very important for us, uh, not only in terms of gaining the indexing level, but also in terms of joining a group of journals that are trying to survive within the perspective of open science. Uh, years later, we joined Redalic, a Mexican mm -hmm. network uh, of non-commercial open access scientific journal in the same direction. These affiliations have not only a scientific, but also a political reason in a context in which since the 90s, international profit groups have been appropriating the intellectual capital generated by science. Open science does not only imply open access in research products, 
but appeal to the collective, the political distribution of research results beyond the utilitarian perspective of science that preaches increased effectiveness, productivity, and competitiveness. This requires the creation of unpriced conditions for the assess, motivating open dialogues between research groups, free exchange of results, free access to read and publish in journals, and self-protection from powerful corporations whose main goal is the commodification of the results, of these results of the articles. This has led us in the debate with other Brazilian editors in our area to think about the role of journals in the direction of things such as justice and social responsibility of science, dialogue between silence and other traditional knowledge in Latin American locations, emphasizing the distribution and recognition of knowledge produced in various languages. Our approach cannot be only technical, as it is about facing political position of open science. For that, it counts on the joint effort of the national development of open science, of, of, of national development agency with the postgraduate programs involved in such a project, uh, and with the certifying and indexing agencies such as Cielo and Redalic. It is a collective effort. This certainly does not prevent an, an approximation with the indexers of international corporations, but it is necessary that this project is not colonized by pricing strategies. In recent years, we have sought to place ourselves in this editorial and scientific perspective. With these themes in mind, we have been uh, dedicating ourselves in the journal to improve article evaluations, create reliable and detailed opinions, and expand forms of financing, always in constant debate with other editors in the area, building scientific policies for our journals. Furthermore, there is an expectation on the horizon of improving aspects related to the creation of databases and open networks in a wide ecosystem that the, the, the in order to to that the generation the generated research results are clearly consistent intelligible criticized and repeatable open mm -hmm. science requires democracy multidirectional scientific communication and democratic government that support such networks. It is clear that the Latin America perspective of open science that we are talking about uh, here does not reject technical criteria. I'm not rejecting the technical criteria linked to an agenda that emphasizes the increase in the replicability and generability of discoveries. This agenda was recently published in journal communication and has many suggestions. For instance, published materials, data and codes, pre-registered studies that's, and submit registered reports, conduct replications, collaborate, implement guidelines for the promotion of openness and transparency, and encourage open science practices. We are not denying all this. Judging by the signifiers involved, involved in this agenda, it is an ideal of openness and transparency to be implemented for the good of the scientific and social community. There is no way to disagree if we defend open science with such general ideals. However, what, were, what we are discussing here is about the universality of such criteria, the strength of each individual guideline. The question that arises for us is, does this apply to the entire planet? Debating universality implies asking whether this criteria of technical effectiveness with an emphasis on quantitative research 
and in certain perspectives of open science, serve everyone. Uh, that is, in scientific and social contexts, different from those of developed countries. Does the examination of the universality of such an agenda, uh, let's say such an, a technical agenda, uh, must face two issues. First question, are such criteria sufficient for South World context? Second question, the emphasis on quantitative research is enough to account for the qualitative aspects. This has been extensively debated in a text in a journal of communication, which has been recently publicated. Uh, it looks like Aida has had technical problems, and um, maybe we should ask a bit. Okay, looks like it's coming back. Otherwise, we can ask some questions too. Hello? Okay. Hello? Hello? Interrupted. <laughs> you were off for some time, uh, but you're back. Uh, sorry. Uh, 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 yeah. I, will re I will retake. Okay. Uh, this has been extensively debated in a text that we published in, in eight hands in Journal of Communication, uh, recent, recently published this agenda in this discussion uh, about Latin American perspective, uh, in, in which I, I, I have participated, but also in another article published in ESPM Journal uh, uh, by Tayane Oliveira and Afonso Buquerque in 21, in this year. And, well, uh, the first question, which was, are such criteria sufficient for South world contexts? Mm -hmm. uh, we must, we must uh, uh, face questions like that. The main problems of open science in Southern countries are not exclusively focused on issues of replicability and generability. We, we have another problems. The question is, will the massive entry of our journals into northern academic capitalism help us to solve these problems? I think it's one question we must, we must face. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. other, one, other one is that the signifiers, openness and transparency, uh, do not synthesize the discourses that bring us together in Southern science, I suppose. We need to reflect and debate better what kind of openness and what kind of transparency is ours in our realities. Mm. Uh, I think all these questions uh, place us on the horizon of a series of situations that we will face in the coming years. Uh, which requires uh, with editors in the area and in the field of human and social sciences, uh, which has been under attack uh, in recent years by the people of the extreme right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Aida, for your presentation. Very interesting points about uh, open access, what is open uh, ex exactly, and what is open science. And um, now I would like to hear Monica about the challenges you face uh, thinking of what Aida said if you uh, face similar uh, questions and problems in editing uh, the, the journal um, in the African continent. Thank yeah. you. Well, um, so, so some of our, our challenges have been very basic challenges. For example, we, we grew very quickly. We started off as a very small, insignificant journal for three years, we were almost not known and so on. When we, 
when we joined hands with intellect, the, the scope of the journal grew and the visibility of the journal grew. And, uh, but of course, you know, joining a publisher like Intellect means you, you also must fall in line with the editorial policies of Intellect and the ethical standards and so on. And, and, and we've, we've, we've done that. And I think it's helped the quality of the journal. But we've had challenges with um, receiving, sometimes you receive a manuscript and you know that the content is excellent. But the language is difficult because the person writing is not a first language English speaker. And yet the ideas are brilliant. And, uh, and you don't want to be entirely rewriting somebody's article. But the journal right now for practical purposes is working only in English. So we talk about the westernization and decolonization and so on. But we are working in English. We are working with a European publisher. Some of us are based, not myself, but other colleagues are based in, in Western-based universities and so on. There are contradictions there, but it's part of the reality of, of, of academia, I guess. The other thing is um, reviewers. We, we do try to have a large pool to keep a large database of reviewers. But uh, you... It's one thing to have very brilliant people in your pool of databases. It's another thing to have people who you can depend on to review an article within the time that you want it reviewed. And we all know sometimes we've fallen, I don't want to say victim, but we have failed in this. But sometimes you have very good reviewers who just don't know anything about deadlines. And that can be very frustrating if you're running a journal. Uh, the other thing is sometimes they, sometimes you get reviews, but they lack the depth that you require, and you have to send it back to another reviewer, um, and so on. The other thing we have had is um, we the scope, the number of, of manuscripts that we receive has grown quite a bit, and sometimes it gets daunting, so we... A couple of years ago, I uh, got into a system called JAWS Evolve, which has been very, very helpful in enabling us to manage the whole editorial process right from the beginning to the very time the article comes out. And we keep working with the, the proprietors of this system to refine it and, and so on. And that has been very helpful. The last thing I want to talk about is marketing. It is challenging to market. It's challenging to market under normal circumstances. It has been extremely challenging to market the journal uh, in light of the current pandemic that we are all dealing with because conferences have come to a standstill. They are largely virtual and so on. There are some benefits, of course, in marketing virtually, but there is something about the physical marketing that we miss, that, that, that we would like to have back if we could. Sorry. Thank you, Monica. Uh, you pointed to a problem that is very common and other editors has uh, had pointed to that, is that finding the right reviewer and getting this work done um, in time and also in the way that it would help the, the author or would help the editor to uh, make decisions about the manuscript. And um, uh, there was, uh, we were talking in the last um, session of this, in the last uh, event in last month, that uh, the review work is not paid as many, all the other was your work, for example, as editors. And so it's a kind of precarity we have because um, at the same time, it's a kind of gift work as Larry Gross, gift economy, as Larry Gross said in the other uh, interview, in the other talk. So um, is there any solution for that? I know that as, uh, for example, as a civil servant, I, am, uh, I work for a federal university, so I understand that as part of my work. But is there any 
uh, solution to this problem? I'd like to hear you both about this. Yeah, um, I can speak about that very briefly. I don't know that paying reviewers would not create new problems. I think there is something pure about people reviewing because they want to grow the body of knowledge and they want to improve the quality of writing and so on for its own sake. I think once you, once you add the payment element, I fear that you might, maybe this is a little old fashioned, but I think you might um, dilute the process a little bit. That's my thinking. So I am not too keen to push for paying reviewers, even if a journal could afford it. Yeah, I agree. I agree this is not the solution. Uh, I doubt I'd like to hear you. We'd like to hear you. the reviewers don't well you don't listen to me yes now uh, we can uh, hear you now yes, yes. Uh, i agree with monica uh, that uh, if we pay the reviewers i don't know if it would solve this kind of problem uh, mm. i think that the main problem is that the reviewers are, uh, have too many tasks to deal with Correct. all the time with university with a lot of journals <laughs> and it is very difficult to 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 well to do all these at the same time but well my experience with reviewers is that we have good reviewers in general and we have 10 percent of reviewers that even if you you pay them they will not go bad <laughs> And this occurs also in the in the federal agency. We had this kind of problem, not only journals, but in the federal agency. Sometimes you have a review of two lines, and we don't do anything with it. It, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't help you to, to decide. So you, you can you mm. must you must read again the text, and you uh, even uh, sometimes you, you must send to a third uh, review reviewer. And well, uh, but I think th this this kind of problem is 10 percent or 15 percent of the old. Mm. I think that yeah. what clings a reviewer to this system is the dedication to science. I, I don't know if my, my view is too idealistic, but <laughs> it's what I think. No, I agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no, it's not. It's to the the building of science. It's like a, a collective and public commit commitment. Yes, yes, yes. To I science. Yeah. Yes, I yes. I, I yeah, I agree with that. And then um, I, I have a question for both of you too about the how can we build or strengthen the connection between south south to south. Um, uh, authors and editors from the African continent and authors and editors and reviewers, etc., from the global south, I would say, from South Asia, from South America, for example. And um, because uh, we've been very related to the so-called West, right? So I'd like to hear you about the possibilities of exchange and to strengthening our publisher, uh, publishing and our, yeah, our connection. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, can I respond? Yes. Well, I think it's very important that uh, we have a, an axis south to south and not only an axis south to, to north, but there is a, uh, there is a, uh, a tendency to, to ask for people to to make connections with uh, the the English spoken countries uh, in general, but I think we must we must uh, uh, have other perspectives south to south, uh, yes. and in other languages like Spanish and uh, even in Portuguese in other countries in Africa, for instance. And I, I think this is very important. We must we must have not one direction. Uh, uh, 
uh, linking us with the the speaking world, the, the, the English speaking world, but also with other languages. Mm. Yeah. We had a, there was a journal um, run by uh, Africa Africa ACCE, an association of African academics, anyway, many years ago. And they published everything bilingually. Every article was translated into French, so it was English and, and French. And yet I still think that that's a very good effort, but I think we need to go beyond, um, beyond French and English and Portuguese and actually have some of the, the bigger, the stronger local languages in the South also publishing academic work. Because I think, um, I, I, I don't know how else um, knowledge will grow indigenously if we don't do that. I think we, we need to, we need to be willing to start small and have some of the languages, um, especially in Africa where English, Spanish and Portuguese are not native to anybody, almost. Uh, I think that's important. So, so I, I kind of, that is something that I would love to see one day. Okay, Zulu journal, I'm sure there may be some. Mm -hmm. Or Swahili journal or something. Uh, some journals, many publications are published in uh, bilingual or published in three languages. Do you think this is a good idea and what are the challenges to do that, the costs and the possibilities? Hmm. Difficult because it, it costs money to 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 check the, the even if you ask the author to 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 make the translations you must check it and it's, it's a it's a very very difficult for us in nowadays when the the federal agents reduced the, the our budgets I think it's it's difficult sometimes uh, some journals. Uh, have the, the support of their universities here, which uh, pay this service to translate in English. I think in Brazil, the, the second language is always English. In matrices, for example, in, in BJR, uh, I, I don't think there is a lot of experiences in Spanish, for instance. But, uh, well, uh, I think now it, it is a, a little difficult to, to make ends meet, even in one language, <laughs> and in, in two or three languages, it would be very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here from Raquel Recuero. Uh, she says that Larry Gross at the last me uh, meeting we have the last conversation pointed to some interesting ideas about how the global South is often misrepresented and on the so-called international journals, which are mostly about research done in the north in the north. And usually when research is done in and about the global south, it's um, very located. It's like some special research and not the, the, the mainstream research. So sometimes they don't even mention that some research is made in the US because it's just uh, taken for granted. So um, what, what do you think about this? I'll let you go first, Jose. Sorry, Monica. Sorry, I, I was saying Jose can go first on that one. Okay. I think I think uh, I think it's difficult uh, uh, this this relationship this relationship between South and North is always difficult, and I think we are subrepresented not only in as authors but also as reviewers and well it, it's very it's very uh, it's a difficult uh, uh, relationship but i think uh, uh, things 
things are going on and, and some researchers are trying to, to well, to, to be represented. But I think our, our direction must be not only in this direction in order to be represented in the, in the North, but also in what we were talking about in last question in the direction of South-South, in, in uh, dealing with other languages as Spanish, as, as Portuguese. I think we must, uh, we must fight in, in many directions, not in only in trying to be better representation, represented in, in the North. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's tremendous pressure in the south, at least in our part yes. of the south, there's tremendous pressure to prove yourself on yes. the global scene. And yes. sometimes <laughs> you spend many years doing research that is of not much relevance at home at all. Uh, and, and that's sad, really. So yes, I agree. I don't, yeah. OK. OK, thank you. I have another question that is a bit close to this one. And uh, it's about uh, that um, article published about three years ago where four intellectuals from the area of communication uh, published this article called Communication So White, saying that um, usually the articles, the reviewers, the publishers are usually men and white, and this would exclude the um, point of view of uh, people of color, of women, of uh, scholars from other backgrounds, and other hegemonic uh, group. So uh, I would like to, um, and they also, they are Paula Chakravati, Rachel Kuo, Victoria Grubbs, and Carlton Mc Cuban. This is a question of mine. Um, and also they, they call the attention to the practice of men cites men. So I would like to know if as editors, you um, care for this diversity when you think of uh, authors, reviewers, and et cetera, to um, build, um, well, to, to, to publish your, your issues and uh, your, uh, yeah, your journal. Thank you. When, when you, you receive an article, uh, you must be very careful uh, which reviewers do you choose for each theme. You, you, you must be sensitive because uh, you, if you have an article uh, which discusses uh, themes like feminism or racism, uh, there are uh, reviewers who studied this, this kind of team, and you must uh, be sensitive to choose this, this uh, in order not to, to get bias in the results. And I think it, it is the main, the main uh, concern of the editor. Uh, it is very important to, to begin correctly. And to begin correctly uh, uh, is to, to, to choose the reviewers who historically in the field has studied this kind of problem. And uh, well, uh, I think it, it, this is the most important uh, thing. Uh, on the other side, when you, you get the results, you must, uh, you must uh, uh, look if the reviews uh, respected this, this uh, let's say, uh, the political axis of the, the, the analysis cons built in the article. Uh, if the article doesn't respect this axis, uh, you must ask for a third or a fourth review. I think the editor must be sensitive uh, in this direction. I, I, I have to admit that when, when I, if I'm editing an issue, any good quality article, regardless of who has written it, whether they are male or female, black or white, is an attractive thing. You want a good article. So, so it's difficult to resist. 
if, if, if it tips the balance, you are more likely to lean towards the quality of the article than this is another woman, so I won't publish how. This is another man, so I won't publish him. So, so that that, that those types of balance are difficult. We in our journal we found that it's much easier to take care of geographical distribution. We we our eyes our antennas are up for geographical representation in an issue. So it's unlikely that we'll have an issue that has everybody from Europe or everybody from Africa or something like that. Or if it's even within Africa, we try to see that there's some West Africa, some East Africa. But it's not easy because if you're, if you're battling to get an issue out and you have a good quality article, you will publish it, even if it tips the diversity balance. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you can tell it by the subject, by the topic discussed, sometimes. Uh, because uh, mm -hmm. a, a scholar from a Latin American country would be more interested in topics from a Latin American country, for example. But this is not always yes. uh, the, the, the true. Uh, well, uh, we have. Yeah, please go on. Now, sorry, I was going to say that for, of course, our journal in particular focuses on Africa and African media studies. Yeah. So in a way, the scope is narrow. The authors certainly don't have to be African, but the themes, the focus has to be African. And so in that sense, we try to get a balance, but you can only balance so much if you are geographically focused on an area. Yes, yes. Um, we have some more questions. One of them is still about translation, because I asked about translation. Is that um, Patricia Mora asks, asks that, um, so if you don't have readers of uh, some language, uh, it would be, is it really relevant for a journal to be translated? So, um, so the amount of readers do, does the amount of readers justify the translation? She's just uh, making this question to balance the idea of translating or not, and also the costs involved in, in translating articles, I guess. I think uh, if I would, uh, I would choose a, a language to translate, I would choose Spanish, not English. But uh, our journals, that make this the second translation, uh, the second language, uh, they choose English, like Matriz mm -hmm. and like BJR. And well, uh, we must ask them if they they had uh, readers in English. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, there is another question by Raquel Recuero. She's asking, uh, it's a quite practical question. Yeah. Yes. What are your ideas about reviews that are not, let's say, collegial? So should the editor interfere, edit the review, or just send it plain as it was received to the author? It depends on the on the problem of the review. If, yes. if, if you have a brief review and we, we can't decide, we, we ask for a third opinion and a fourth opinion. If uh, uh, there is a lack of, 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 of uh, well, uh, uh, of something in the analysis of the reviewer, you can talk to him. You can, uh, I didn't understand this. Can you, can you explain better? Uh, what did you like? What did you, do? you can, you can ask the reviewer, but it depends. If he sent three lines, uh, well, it's lost. <laughs> it's a lost review. <laughs> it's desperate. Yeah, we, <laughs> we try. We, we we try not to interfere with the with the artistic freedom of the reviewer. Yes. I guess. Yes. Yeah. But but quality, we must interfere. I mean, yes. if it's badly written, we'll send it back, even if it's a review. We will not publish it as it is just because it's a review. But we try not to interfere with the artistic freedom of the review. Yes, uh, I think most, and I think uh, most, most editors do that. 
Yes, I think most of the of the times we don't interfere. It's not necessary. I think 80 or 90 percent of the reviews are good. Sometimes, mm -hmm. That's sometimes true. you have a problem when the first review is positive and the second is negative. This is a problem because you you can't decide, and you you, you must ask for for a third or for a fourth review to decide. Are you talking about peer review or? Yes. Or is it yes. peer review? So I got it wrong. Yeah. I thought you were talking about film review, book review type of thing. If no, it's no, peer no. review, that's different. If no, I guess it's about sorry to interrupt you. I I guess it's about uh, double blind peer review. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yes, yes. The, the system we use in Brazil. Okay. Yeah. Then then I would like to rip to refine my comment which is that uh, if it's if it's if we are talking about peer review whether or not you should interfere i think yes i think i agree here with jose that if if you think the person for example the person declares that this article is trash and there is every evidence that this article is well researched and well written and so on you must challenge the reviewer yeah, I, I think she was asking something like this, like if the comment is not kind or respectful to the author. Yeah, if they then I edit, I edit the commentary. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have violent, <laughs> sometimes you have violent. Yes, views. yes, yes, that, that, yes. I think that the editor must cut the, 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 yeah. the well, the, the sure, yeah, yeah, you work violent. as a teacher. Yes, you, you must reduce the discharge, the affect, affection charge. <laughs> the trauma. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the potion, the potion. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's not good to be rejected, at least if it, it's no. a nice way. At least do it gently. Yeah. 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 Sure. 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 Um, there's a question. A question from Rafael Roman. He asks, uh, "What tips do you offer for young researchers who want to submit a manuscript to your journal and have no experience in the subject?" In the subject. Young young authors or young reviewers? Young researchers, young authors. Authors. What is the question? Uh, um, uh, what tips? What tips, que dicas, né? Uh, what tips do you offer for young researchers or people who are not young but are not experienced in the research uh, process and the research publishing and um, who want to submit a manuscript to your journal uh, and have no experience? People want to, what, what would you, um, yeah. Well, first what, First, first of all, I will invite the authors to read our articles, our published uh, articles in the past, because, well, to, to feel uh, uh, which texts ha had, has been approved. Uh, second, to read the, the norms, the norms, uh, uh, yeah. the, the code of the ethics, guidance. the norms, all the function, the functioning, the operation of the, the review of the journal. Uh, and well, you must try, uh, <laughs> you must try and when you receive uh, the, the result, you, you improve your article and if you, you are not approved, you send to another journal. Well, you get better, you, you, you are, you improve your, your knowledge of the functioning of the journals. I think it is an experience. You must try and try. And, 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 and you may want to, it's a terrible thing to say, but you may want to start with a smaller journal and upgrade. Yes. Get accepted and gain confidence yes. from publishing with a fairly small, maybe local journal, and then go on to regional, then go on to global if need be, and so on. Um, it's a journey. Yes, I agree. It's I agree. Journey. Yeah, it's like start, start small and then go on uh, yes. trying other, yeah, start more local, then try my more global, yeah. Yes, yes. 
Um, let's have a look at the questions here. Just a bit. Um, yeah. Uh, Patricia is commenting that, uh, Aida, I think that we don't have enough readers. Significações, I think it uh, translates the article uh, written for those for special issues, but they are not very much very as accessed. They don't have many accesses. So, um, yeah, this is the point of balancing the pros and cons of translating, right? Hmm. Okay, um, yeah. great. Let me check here if you have more uh, questions. Um, uh, excuse me just for a moment, our participants, I'll give a, a say something in Portuguese, Monica. Um, a live vai ficar legendada em português no canal do YouTube da Compos. A próxima live, para quem está nos assistindo, vai acontecer no dia 7 de outubro, às 18 horas, com Jerônimo, Jerônimo Rivera Betancourt, da Palavra Clave, Beatriz Dornelis, da Famecos, e Gilson Porto Júnior, do Observatório. A mediação vai ser de Lisiane Aguiar, da UFRN. Então, já estão todos convidados para o, o, o próximo evento que vai acontecer é, nesse mesmo canal aqui da Compost. Um, estamos aqui ainda... É, estamos aqui conversando com os editores. E... Sim. Um, I would like to ask you if you um in in the practice of uh editing the journals if you uh think that you know where does the innovation come from usually does it can you say uh or can you uh perceive uh where you see more uh, novelty, or you see more new professions, or this is just well distributed about, among authors and places where the articles come from. Uh, I would say, I I'm asking this because I think that sometimes because of the um, uh, difficulties of access of younger and of people from the global south to international journals sometimes i think that they um, run the risk of being uh talking about the same subject subjects and with the same authors as references well this is just a curiosity i have it's just a question of mine well uh, uh Sorry, my the question internet started went. talking about the innovation. Is that that? What kind of innovation? C can you synthesize? Be yeah, it was a long. It was a long question. Yes, <laughs> yes, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm asking if you can see uh, where can you uh, detect some new ideas coming in the field of communication as editors of journals. Can you see it coming from, I don't know, I, I know it's a very general question, but I'd like to hear you about the most innovative um, ideas and articles you've been receiving, and if there is a pattern or if there is um, something that would characterize these. Well, I, I think that the, the novelties come from the research. I think last year's we had uh, uh, new articles about the, the, the function of social media. I think it, there is an increase in this theme, uh, very, very empirical, empirical research about the function. And, and it's, for instance, uh, linked to the extreme right. I think that there are lots, lots of, of people, of researchers, mm -hmm trying to understand this phenomena, this communication phenomena. 
And I think this is uh, uh, this has to do with the, the the political context we live since since uh, uh, 2016, after the impeachment and, and after the, the the election of Bolsonaro. I think I think uh, uh, this uh, uh, let's say this is the themes uh, uh, that emerged. I think uh, there is a great. Uh, uh, a lot of research about this, but well, I don't know if this is what the the, the what was uh, questioned. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious about topics and tendencies, and well, yeah, in, in research, yeah, and um, I would also uh, like to ask you that. What can we do living in this um, reality nowadays? In this um, context where science and uh, research and journals and uh, all are at risk in a in a context that we don't have much uh, credibility and then also support from the government. Sorry, Monica, uh, if you'd like to comment any of the, the two questions. Sorry, I just merged to that's okay. I just wanted to add to the first one that he talked about, the social media, is the, the return of discussions about conspiracy theory related to fake news. Um, that, that I think there's been a huge resurgence of that in the last year or two. Um, I, in African context, we've also had a lot of discussion, new discussion about de-Westernization of education, you remember the fees must fall and everything. So the, the westernization, the colonization of education, of research, of epistemologies and so on and so forth. So I think those two areas seem, seem to be kind of coming up again. They are not new, but they seem to be coming up again. And like you said, they are related to the political context. Okay, uh, there is a more specific question here was for Aida. Question. Yeah, for Aida about Galaxia. Yeah, uh, there's a question by Deborah Gadri. She's asking uh, that you talked about the inclusion of the journal uh, Galaxia Tiel. Uh, which were the main challenges for the editorial board after that? And did the submissions number changes? Were internal process affected with this inclusion? Well, it's very difficult to enter Cielo. We, we, it took us five years to 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 manage to to enter Cielo. It, it's a very difficult process because they, there are a lot of requirements, and well. And the others, the other indexers are also difficult. The, the Clarivate and, and the indexer are so difficult to enter. Uh, I think uh, after you enter the 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 number of uh, of articles grow. I think mm. uh, uh, yeah. well. Uh, it, when you you enter this kind of of indexer you have more more work <laughs> you have more labor it is uh, it, i don't know yeah. if there, there are any 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 more question yeah so you you started to receive more articles to be reviewed yes. right yes and also more readers yes i think so i think so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that the case with the intellect too, Monica? Being published by intellect, uh, you 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 said you had uh, there was a huge growth in a short period of time, right? Yes, and 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 of course, being published with intellect also comes with being indexed. In a lot of databases and so on, and 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 the, the key thing is your visibility grows. 
and uh, it comes with some challenges, but I think there are lots of benefits with that visibility. More people know about you, more people inquire about you. You get articles from more corners of the world um, that, that you didn't even know were interested in Africa and, and so on. So, yeah, I think that definitely the workload therefore grows also. We, we've been overwhelmed, I think, since we started getting indexed in some of these databases. The articles are very, very many. I see. Did you have to uh, have more people working working with you? Yeah, we have. Okay. We, we started off with just three people actually doing the editing. Now we have a team of 12 or more. I don't remember the number, but it's a fairly large number. and. And so they take turns, people take turns editing issues and, and, and it makes it more manageable. Otherwise it was overwhelming because before you finish this issue, the next issue was here and it was very difficult. And everybody was busy with their academic work, etc. So we have, have more hands, now. all volunteers, which is a blessing. Good, good. What about you, Aida? Do you work with uh, many people at the galaxy? Well, we have the the the, the editor, the, the council, the council, the scientific council, mm -hmm. and uh, that help very much. And we have a, a, a commission of of people and students, which which helps us with the day to day activities. But uh, there are not so many people. I, I, I think uh, we have we have uh, ten people that helps mm -hmm. us with various activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, there's a question here by Rodrigo Martins. He's asking, uh, "What are your opinions about the continuous continuous publication model instead of the issues and volumes?" Uh, Cielo, for, for once, uh, encourages adopting this form of uh, publication. I think he's asking if Cielo encourages this, this kind of publication. Yes, Cielo, Cielo, Cielo encourages the continuous publication. We, we started the continuous publication this year, 21. And well, I, I am... I am entering this process uh, uh, recently and well i think it's better but uh, uh, you can you have a lot of things at the same time occurring at the same time you must analyze uh, the new articles you must uh, make the text revision of the approved ones and you must uh, send the revised uh, to get the XML archive, and you 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 send it to CL, and, and you have a lot of things uh, happening at the same time, and you you turn mad with the continuous publication. <laughs> you must have a, a tables of controlling because <laughs> yeah. if you don't have, you get lost easily lost. <laughs> mm. Well, I, I, I'm I. I I started this process this year, but I am, well, I am getting used to it. I thought you were going to say you are slowly going mad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, Monica, is it the same at the uh, Journal of African Media Studies? Uh, we don't do continuous publication. We do three issues a year. Oh. And uh, and it, I think it's a little more predictable. So what we do is we pace ourselves. If, if you are ed editing issue one, it's unlikely that you'll be editing issue two as well. So it gives yes. you a bit of a break until your turn comes to edit again. So that helps. I, pre I prefer this this kind of, of editing, editing issues, because continuous is, 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 is mad. Yeah, you, you must be very organized to, to yes, do this continuous, yes. Yes. I can imagine. Yeah. Yes, but but Cielo, Cielo uh, wants the, the continuous publication. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Esther Hamburger is uh, she's the editor of Significação. She's asking if the number of readers has increased. I think it has, right? Uh, yes. 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 I don't have the numbers here, but yes. Uh, and with the new, with the new, the new system, uh, we changed the, the system. The control of all these statistics will 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 turn better. But initi it initiated in July, and so uh, I think we will have data, better data next year. Yeah, it's quite recent, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, with Monica, the process happened uh, before, right? It's it's been some years. Yes, it's it happened before. long before. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I know that they've gone up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I would like to know how the pandemic has affected or not the process of editing your journals. Well, I don't, uh, 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 I don't uh, think that it had affected the editing process. I, I think we, we have received more texts. I feel that we have received more texts, yes, but but <laughs> people were in, in their homes, and I think they 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 started to write uh, to write and well. But the process of editing doesn't alter too much. Yeah. Yeah, because most of it was online anyway, at least for us. Most of the editing, the searching for peer reviewers and so on was online anyway, so it didn't make a yeah. difference. But we've got a, a huge number of articles even about the pandemic. I mean, we tried to do a thematic issue and there were too many articles even for one issue, yes. which yes. rarely happens with other topics. So maybe that's another thing. That's what so, I mentioned. Yeah. Are you, uh, are you listening to me? Can you yes. hear me now? Okay. Yeah, that's what I yes. imagined because uh, many scholars were uh, not working face to face, so they would have some more time uh, at home. But I have read that this has affected women in a different way that it affected men scholars. That women would be more uh, overcharged with uh, domestic yeah. issues and care of women, yeah. care of the elderly and the sick, and men would be more uh, would be more free. It would be freer to 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 write. Um, I mean, not everybody, but I've uh, read something about this. And at in our case at Gashemiji, we uh, took about three months to adapt to the remote um, teaching. So during this time, I imagine many people, not only at Gashemiji, but at many universities around the world, were taking this time to finish papers that were not ready and things like that yeah so i has, think that the pandemic i think that the pandemic affected more the classes than the journals i think yeah mm -hmm. yeah i i agree with you yeah well um okay i think we've had uh all the, the questions here is there any other questions ao público? Se quiser fazer perguntas tanto em português quanto em inglês, é, estamos abertos aqui. Se não, eu acho que a gente pode encerrar essa ótima conversa com a José Luiz Aidar e Mônica Tibita. Obrigado. Okay, is there anything I, I'd like to thank you so much for being here with us at Compose? And I would like to know if you'd like to add something about, well, the process of publication, the process of editing, and it like that. No, I, I would only uh, uh, 
to thank you, to thank Compos, to thank Laura for the mediation. And it was a, very, a, a pleasure to, to talk with Monica and to, to, and to hear from the African Journal. And well, uh, uh, I thank you so much. Same here. I also would like to say obrigado. Yeah. And uh, it's been, that's the only word in Portuguese I know. And it's been a, it's been a real pleasure, really. It's been wonderful. It's always nice to talk to other editors because it is yeah. such a lonely world otherwise. So it's mm -hmm. really nice. It's sad that we can't see the audience, but thank you very much for all your questions as well. Okay, thank you so much, Monica. Thank you so much, Aida. Thank you for the audience. Obrigada ao uh, público pelas perguntas e já convidamos para a próxima edição aqui nesse mesmo canal da Compós no dia 12, 12 de outubro. 7, né? 7 de outubro. 7 de outubro. Obrigada por me lembrar, Aida. É 7 de outubro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye. bye.